Hello and welcome back for another VMK in the C++ programming series. In this VMK I'll be talking about exceptions, how to use them, when to use them, and I'll be describing the pitfalls that you could fall into if you use them improperly. Let's start writing some code. I'm going to start off simple. So here I have a project where I just have a main file. Uh, all I'm going to be doing is outputting a string to the screen and we return zero. So when I compile and run this, we can see we have our text string displayed to the screen. Now, anytime you create a new project, one that doesn't depend on other libraries, you should strongly consider using exceptions in your code. The rationale for this is exceptions will make your code a lot easier to read and it will also enforce that your code will behave properly with minimum amount of code that you need to write. So exceptions will actually clean up uh, your memory if you use them properly. If you don't then you can actually run into a lot of problems uh, using exceptions improperly. So what I'm going to try to teach you in this VMK is to show you the tricks that you need to know when using exceptions so that you don't use them incorrectly. So what exactly are exceptions? Exceptions really are a way to allow you to have a, a logic path through your code uh, that is the exception to the normal logic path. So for instance, let's say that I had something like this. I had some sort of if statement saying, you know, if I call some function, then I'll do this. Otherwise, if that function returns false, then we're going to go down into here. So this is option one. If the, the call fo foo function returns true, we're going to do this, this uh, code over here. And if uh, call foo returns false, then we have our second option here, so then we're going to run this code here. If we incorporate exceptions inside of our function call here, we can actually have a third path, option 3, that gets executed. And, ex and option 3 would basically only get executed if the exception is thrown inside of this function. If it's not thrown, then you can either go here or here, if it is thrown, neither of these are called and instead you go through option 3. So there's a special syntax that we need to abide by to be able to make this work. And the syntax looks something like this. We create a try block, we put all of this stuff in it, so this basically says please try to call this function here and do all of this logic. If everything works normally and no exceptions are called, that's it. That's all that happens is we run through this code. If, however, there is an exception thrown anywhere inside of this try block, then we exit out of the try block and we go into something called a catch statement. Now with a catch statement, there are a number of ways to write these uh, and all of them have a parameter that you need to pass into here. So by default, you can create a catch statement that catches all different kinds of exceptions. And the way that you would write that in syntax is you write catch with three dots. These are ellipses. Uh, that basically means this catch statement will catch all different kinds of exceptions that are thrown inside of this try block. So this basically means now if something in the try block threw an exception, then option three would get called. If there is no exception thrown up here, then option 3 would not get called. Now also with a catch statement, you can stack multiple catch statements. So um, if for instance you know that you're going to be throwing an exception of a certain type, then that's a type that you would want to catch. So for instance you could have something like this. I want to be catching a integer which I'm throwing, so I need to declare it somehow. You declare it as a parameter pass into the catch statement and then over here this is the code that's going to get executed and uh, in this execution you can actually see what is the value that was thrown from inside of here and the value that was thrown is going to be some sort of integer so that integer we're going to be using inside of this catch statement. 
So that's the general syntax that we follow when we are creating exceptions. So let's write some code here to test this out. Let's create our foo function. It's going to return a bool. And all we're going to do is uh, display a message to the screen. So std cout inside call foo. Okay, and let's by default here return true so that we can see that we are actually going to go into here. This one will be option two. And I'll comment this out for a second. And we'll demonstrate option three as well. Okay, so compiling and running right now, our function is returning true. So we see we have option one displayed to the screen. If I make this function return false and rerun it, then we see option two is being displayed to the screen. So that's exactly where it's getting called. And notice option three is not being displayed because it's not being called. If I do want to call this section here, then we need to throw an exception. So to do that, we use the keyword throw, and we need to specify what is it that we want to be throwing. Well, as we said over here, we could throw integers, we could throw floats, we could actually throw a class that we created, we could throw pretty much anything we want. So for now, let's just say I'm gonna be throwing a value of three. If I run this code, notice what happens. We are now in option three. Well, that's a little deceiving. Let's say I throw uh, 78. Just to be clear here that option three is being called down below and I am throwing uh, 78, which means that I am throwing something, so I am being caught inside of here. And because I've called here, it doesn't matter whether we return true or false, the execution never goes down into here. As soon as we throw, the compiler knows that we're going to exit out of here, go into the catch statement, and we display this message. So that's the general idea of how exceptions work. So now we can see if we add in this catch statement here, we can catch uh, uh, something that we've thrown, and we can actually show the value that was thrown to us. So option 3a, option 3b, and here we're going to display the value that was actually thrown to us. So notice now we have option 3a, 78, that was the value that was thrown to us. Let me fix the formatting here a little bit better. So now if I change this value to, I don't know, 88, rerun it, you can see option 3a is being called because 88 is being thrown. However, if I change this and change this to 8.8 .8 and rerun it, now we're getting option 3b, which is the second one down here, not this one, because I am throwing a double value. So when I throw that, it comes out of here, out of the try statement, and takes a look. Okay, am I trying to catch an integer? Well, no, I threw a double, not an integer, so it doesn't go into here. It goes into this catch statement and says, oh, okay, uh, this catch statement catches everything, so this must be what I wanted to have executed. If, for instance, I am missing a catch statement, so I throw something, but I don't have something to catch it, what will happen? Well, if I run this, you'll notice that I get a exception unhandled error, and it shows that I was throwing a double. Just be aware that if you are throwing, you need to be catching. If you don't catch your exception, then you will have a runtime error. It's always safest to have a catch statement that catches everything, just in case you have other catch statements that you're trying to handle your exceptions with, and then you happen to throw something by a different value that gets missed, always have a catch all statement in your code so that it can catch all the exceptions that were not handled up above. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, when you do create a catch statement like I do here, 
make sure that you catch your value by reference. Notice I have the ampersand sign here to indicate that I am catching a integer by a reference, not as a pointer. You could theoretically catch this as a pointer or as a value like this. This, this will work as well. However, doing this, what you're actually doing is the, the throw statement here creates a integer of value 8 and then over here we catch it but we actually catch a duplicate of the value that was thrown so we were making a copy now with integers and floats that's not that big of a deal because you're only talking four bytes of memory however if you are throwing a class which, which is what I'm going to be showing you in a second here you would be copying that class that you constructed over here so that may be expensive to do so I wouldn't recommend doing it always 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 catch your statements by reference as opposed to by value or by pointer. If you if you do try catching things by pointer you run yourself into a lot of headaches because then you have to manage the values that you're constructing here but then you need to deallocate them somewhere so uh, avoid that completely don't don't try to throw by pointer. Okay so that's the general structure now at the beginning I, I said that exceptions make your code cleaner. Well typically when you have some sort of function that does some work that returns a boolean, the boolean will typically tell you whether the function succeeded or not. And then if it didn't succeed, you have to do something special. So you could write code like this where, let's say, I pass in some value, int i, and then let's say I do something like this. If i if i is less than zero then I know that that's some sort of weird error condition so I'll just return false otherwise maybe I'll do some sort of math here do math whatever and then I'll return true if you have structured your code this way then the code that calls your functions would have to look something like this if it's not okay, so let's say I pass in some value. So if this function call returns not okay, then I have to clean up. Otherwise, it's, it's okay, so I can go and do something else. Then maybe I want to do some more work. So I do something here. And then I have another call to that function. So like this. If not, I have to clean up, then I do some more work, and then let's say I do this one more time with some other value. Let's this time say this, then I clean up, otherwise we do some work like so. So you can see we're, what we're doing is we're actually compounding the cleanup here into multiple sections within our code. So I I have to do something, I have to clean it up. I have to do something, I have to clean it up. I have to do something, I have to clean it up. And this could be scattered all over your code everywhere. However, if I change this to use exceptions instead, all of a sudden the logic becomes so much simpler. Notice that if I change this now from a boolean to a void, then I can say if integer, if the integer that's passed in here is less than zero, then we're just going to throw an exception let's just say for now I'm going to throw one. I'll talk about the values that we're going to be throwing in a second but for now let's just say that I'm throwing one. So now what I can do is plainly this. I can call my function and I assume that it's going to succeed. Do my work over here I want to call my function again with some other value okay let's just assume it's going to succeed so I don't need the cleanup and then over here same thing we just assume that it's going to succeed so notice that I've removed all of that cleanup code all of that cleanup code happens to now go into one section all inside of this catch statement so, so looking at the code here to see what it is you're trying to do becomes simpler to look at because all you're doing is calling functions you don't actually have the logic to handle the failure condition, the failure condition is grouped all in one spot so you only have one spot to look for the failures. That's why your code ends up being cleaner. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at what you could be throwing. You could be throwing values like we are here, or more commonly, you'll want to be throwing some sort of a class. So over here, I've created a class. I just called it my class. You can call it whatever you want. And in the class definition, I'm going to create a constructor that takes in one parameter. It's going to take in a std string, like so. And in my private members, I'll just store that std string. So going over here, inside of the constructor, I'll just save the value that gets passed into the constructor. Also inside of the constructor and in the destructor, notice that I'm displaying a string just saying uh, my class is constructed and my class is destroyed so that we can keep an eye on what's going on here. So going back into here, let's say that I do throw my class and I'll just say error. Then down here, I want to catch my class. And what do I want to do with it? Well, let's just display the error message. So I'll need a, well, let's make this public for sake of simplicity. Then down here, I can display my class dot oh I need to include dot str okay let's see if this compiles uh, my class identifier not found Oh, that's because I'm inside of a namespace. So let's just say using namespace VMK. And here, right, this should be an STD string. Okay, so we can build. Let's do a clean, just to make sure that I don't have anything wonky going on. Uh, what's the problem here? Oh, our uh, copy constructor is not implemented, which we need for this to work. So I'll just put it in here. We'll use the default. Do clean, rebuild. Oh, uh, we don't actually want to define it. We just want to say we're going to be using the default. So I think that should fix the problem. Yep. Okay. So going back into here, uh, what were we doing? We're going to be throwing a string that says error. And down here, we're going to be displaying the screen, uh, string to the screen. So running the code, we see that we construct uh, my class constructor. Uh, we display error, which is coming from this here. And then we notice that uh, my class gets destroyed as well. So that seems to be working correctly. To be clear here, I'll show that we are in catch statement. So we see we're in the catch statement. We display the error. And the error that we're displaying here is the one that was being thrown inside of our function call. So this is a typical way that you'll be throwing exceptions because when you do throw, you'll want to have some sort of indication, some sort of value, maybe it's a string, whatever you want really, to tell you when you catch it here whether you should continue running your code or whether you should not. So you need to have some sort of logic to be able to throw back to be caught. Now, to help you with that, you can create a class completely yourself that handles all of that, or you can extend a class which is already provided to you that has some of this exception handling for you. There's a class called STD runtime error. 
So if you extend that one, you'll notice that you can use the functionality within it to handle your exceptions. So let's remove this and inside of our constructor you'll notice that our constructor doesn't uh, like this definition because std runtime error actually does have a value that you need to pass into the constructor. If you open up the help documentation you can see that the runtime error uh, is inherited from a public exception and if you take a look through here you can see that the general functionality is this you have a runtime error inside of STL it'll throw an exception which you can catch like this and what it's what is being thrown is actually stored inside of the what function so what is just a pat um, is an accessor to the message that you pass into that constructor. And if you dig through the actual documentation, you can find inside of STD exception here, here's the class definition. So it has a message which we construct inside of the base, and the base of this guy is class exception, which you can dig through down and see that all it's storing is a constant character pointer to that memory for the what message. So you could actually simplify this even further and instead of throwing my class just be throwing a runtime error. Something like this. So now we're going to be throwing a runtime error and the value of the runtime error we can catch And if we want to show what it is, we can just do e dot what, and that's going to return to us the value that we threw. Oh, uh, over here, let's just comment this code out. Just so that we can run it. And there we go in the catch statement and the value that we threw was error. While we're on the topic of uh, runtime errors, you notice that there are actually a number of exceptions that are handled within uh, the SDL library. There is runtime error, there is overflow error, there is underflow error, um, range error, there's actually a whole bunch of exceptions and all of these are handled already for you inside of the SDL library. So let's see how those would work. For instance, let's say that I'll create a vector which we're going to need to include up here So I'm going to create a vector of ints and I'll push some values on here. One, two, three, and four. And for now I'm just going to go with the catch-all. So I'll comment this out. Okay, if I run this code, nothing should get thrown. We should just come out cleanly. Now let's try to do something that will throw an exception. If I try to access some uh, value inside of this vector that's outside of its range, STL will throw an exception at us. So if I try to grab the value at reference number four, What happens? Well, we get an exception throw. If I try to th uh, access a value at location 3, then no exception is thrown and we exit uh, through our code cleanly. In other words, we go through here and this, let me 
run a statement here. So you notice that now everything is okay. If I change this to a 4, everything is not okay, an exception was thrown. So the exception that is thrown is the one that gets thrown whenever we call the at function. We can just do this and I believe it's something like overflow error. Let's give that a run. Uh, no, it wasn't that one. Well, what we can do is comment this out, not catch it, and it should crash on us and tell us exactly which error was being thrown. Oh, it won't actually compile with no catch blocks here, so let's put one catch statement in there and try running that. Okay, so it's throwing out of range. There we go. Which means over here we can just change this to be out of range. and rerun and now you can see in the cache statement invalid vector t subscript is what gets thrown to you automatically uh, by SDL so you're trying to access index 4 but there's only four elements in the uh, vector so that's an invalid index we know that this is 0 this is 1 this is 2 and this is 3, so if I try to access number 4, which is the next one down here, we don't have access to that, so that throws. But you do need to be careful, not all STL functions will throw. If, for instance, we try to do something like this, where we are accessing the fourth element, which is invalid, and we're using the square bracket operator to get at that element, then notice that when I run this code, the program actually crashes. It's crashing because we're trying to access an element outside of the vector. If I change this to number 3 and run this, then everything is okay is displayed on the screen because that is valid. You need to be aware that there are some STL functions that will throw and others are written in such a way that they won't throw. The, the rationale for that is the ones that don't throw are slightly faster because they don't have this extra try catch block surrounding them. But you do need to have your own added protection around them which means that you would have to have some sort of logic if you are not entirely sure how large those things are and you're trying to access them. For that reason, if you're not sure, you should be using exception safe functions and instead of using the square bracket operator, use the at function call which will throw if there is a problem. Okay, now let's take a look at how exceptions work inside of classes. There is a very hard and fast rule that you must follow when using exceptions within classes. If you don't follow this rule, your code will break quite spectacularly. The rule that you must follow is never ever throw an exception inside of a destructor. Which means, if you have a class, so let's go back into our this class here. I'm going to remove this. I'll have some sort of value that I pass into the constructor. I have a destructor. Uh, back over here, let's define my constructor. Uh, here's my destructor. Okay, now going back into here, let's include this, include this. I'll take this out. Uh, let's take this out. I won't need that anymore. And Let's go back to our catch-all. Okay, so let's say that I want to create my class. And inside of this class, right now all we're doing is displaying a message and then we're going to destruct it and display another message. So <clears throat> just to make sure that everything's kosher here, 
my class is constructed, everything is okay, and then my class is destructed and we return. So that's what we are expecting. We construct the guy, we display this, and then when we lose scope of the try statement, this guy here gets destructed, so that's why we see the message displayed to the screen, and then we re just return out of our main function, so that's the end of our program. Okay, so let's take a look at the setup here. Uh, my class is going to get created, and if everything is okay, we'll display. If there's an exception thrown, we'll display this. Inside of my class constructor, we're going to display a message saying that we construct, and when we destroy, we're going to display another message. Our my class has a member variable called monster, which is of type monster, which is this class up here. When monster gets created, then this monster constructor gets called. When monster gets destroyed, then this destructor gets called here. Inside of the destructor, I'm throwing an exception in. This, you shouldn't be doing this, this is very bad. But I'm just showing you for demonstration purposes what will happen when you throw an exception within a destructor. So do not write this kind of code in your programs because this is very bad enough and you'll see why in one second. Actually, let me comment this out first. Let's run it through so we can see the logic flow that happens here. Monster gets constructed, my class gets constructed, everything is okay. Monster gets destroyed, or my class gets destroyed, monster gets destroyed, and then we return. So that's the correct order of events that we are expecting to see. Now, if I were to throw an exception inside of the destructor here, what bad things will happen? Well, looking at the output, monster gets constructed, my class gets constructed, everything is okay, my class gets destroyed, monster gets destroyed, and an exception is thrown. Nothing bad looks like is happening here. However, that's not the real issue. The real issue is if you ha end up compounding exceptions one on top of another. Let's say that, first of all, let's take out this throw statement and instead, let's say that I throw an exception here. So I'm constructing my class and in the midst of constructing it, something goes wrong, so I throw an exception. This is actually another reason why you want to be writing code using exceptions. Typically, when you are constructing an object for a class, you want to pass in all the parameters into that class so that you can successfully construct it to its fullness. If, for whatever reason, the parameters that are passed in here are invalid or they are not sufficient enough to construct this object, if you don't use exceptions there is no good way to tell the color of this class constructor that something has failed. With exceptions that's the way to do it. With exceptions you can basically throw an exception saying I'm sorry I, you told me to construct this specific class but I can't for whatever reason and then I throw an exception explaining why. So that's a very powerful tool you can use when you're programming your code. Now let's take a look at what happens here. I'm in the midst of constructing my class, so I'm going to be constructing monster, and then in the midst of all of that I throw an exception. What do you anticipate will happen to monster? Well let's run this code and take a look. Monster gets constructed, my class gets constructed, I then throw an exception. Automatically the compiler calls monster destroyed for us. It knows that my class is going through a process of constructing all of its member variables. By the time it gets to this point here where we throw, it knows that certain member variables have been constructed so those ones it deallocates the memory for and that's why we see monster destroyed gets called. Exception is thrown and then we return. Notice that the destructor of my class is never called. It never gets called because my class never fully got constructed. So that's the power that you get by using exceptions inside of classes. Okay, so now let's take a look at why throwing an exception inside of a destructor is bad. So if I do this, what's going to happen now? I'm constructing my class, I throw an exception. So I'm in the process of throwing an exception and we've just seen that the destructor of this guy is going to get called, which means that a second throw is going to happen in the midst of one throw already. So throw two is going to happen 
and then we're telling the compiler, oh, throw another exception. Well, that's illegal. You cannot throw an exception as a result of throwing an exception. If you do that, the compiler is going to get confused and not know what to do, and it's going to complain. And the complaint that you get is this, debug error, abort has been called. So by default, the compilers are written in such a way that if you are in the midst of throwing an exception and you try to throw another exception, then automatically abort is called and the program terminates. There's no way out of that. So if you don't want your program to abruptly terminate like this, you definitely do not want to be throwing exceptions inside of destructors. You only run into this case when you are inside of destructors. If you had a throw statement inside of a, this constructor here, this wouldn't be an issue. Notice that here, what we're doing is we're constructing my class. In the midst of that, we go into this guy here to construct a monster, but he throws an exception. So automatically this comes out to the catch statement where we display the message and we're done. So throwing, con throwing exceptions anywhere other than destructors is safe. Throwing them in a destructor is not safe. So you should never do that. Uh, so what else can I tell you about exception? Oh, right. Um, let's say that I have a monster here that's going to be throwing an exception. And inside of here, let's say I wanted to catch that exception. Theoretically, I should be able to do something like try doing something here and then catch But how would this work? How would you know that um, this constructor is inside of this try statement? It's really not. It's happening at the construction of this class, not at the execution of the body of the constructor. If I run this, you'll notice that we don't see try or catch being displayed anywhere on the screen. So there's a special syntax that you must abide by to follow the rules for exception handling inside of constructors. So if you do want to handle the catching of a thrown exception during construction, you, you use what is called a functional try block. The way we write this is after the closing bracket of our constructor, you write try and then you have the colon then you would have all your member variables in here so whatever you had now mine is just monster and it is constructed without any parameter so let's say that i had some sort of value int i and that gets saved inside of this monster class so i'm just going to omit that for now so now when i want to construct monster i need to pass in a parameter to do that well to do that, we would do it over here, right? We say monster and then we pass in some value four, five, three, let's say. Okay, so now I have a try statement that says, please try doing this. And after doing all of the constructions, then we're going to display my class constructor. If that fails, then we need a catch statement. So the catch statement goes down below as it normally would after a try block. So I can catch like this and here I can say my class catch. So now let's take a look at what this does. So we have monster constructed, my class catch gets called because I'm throwing an exception and then we exit. So the monster destructor doesn't get called because we never fully constructed monster and because we never fully constructed my class, my class destructor doesn't get called either. Also, 
at the uh, very end we have exception thrown being displayed because my class did throw an exception so it didn't actually complete everything successfully. So that's a special syntax that you would use to accomplish that kind of thing. It does come in handy sometimes uh, but you need to be very careful of the order of events that are being constructed and destructed inside of my class because you do get the automatic destruction handling for you if an exception is thrown as shown previously. So I just wanted to point that out so that you guys knew that it is possible to catch an exception within a constructor uh, where your member variables are throwing exceptions. You can rethrow an exception. So for instance here I'm going to be catching, let's say we're going to be catching that integer that we're throwing. So int i Okay, so my class caught the one and then an exception is thrown. After we catch this exception, we can throw something else. Let's say I throw 3.14. That's perfectly valid as well. So to demonstrate this a little bit better, uh, let's do this. Inside of here, I've changed the catch statement so that I can catch a floating point number, I can catch an integer, and then I catch everything else, and I actually display the values. So if I go back to what we had before, where we are throwing a value of 1 inside of the monster constructor, so that means inside of the catch statement here we're going to be catching the value of 1, but then also that same value is going to be thrown outside of this guy here, because this guy never gets fully constructed, so it should also get caught here and we should see 1 being displayed. So if I run this we see my class caught the value of 1 and then exception is being thrown here and we catch it with the value of 1. But inside of this first catch statement we don't have to throw that same value. We could process it and then we could actually throw something out completely different. In that case here I'm throwing 3.14 so now if I run this notice that my class catches the value of 1 but then this value is gone now and we are throwing 3.14 so that over here we're catching 3.14 and we don't actually catch uh, 1. If I reverse the order of this we should still have the exact same result. So there we go. While I'm on the topic of rethrowing, um, here we saw that if I don't specify this then we rethrow the same value that uh, was thrown to me. That's a special handling though that only happens within a class constructor. Any other conditions once you catch an exception it doesn't go any further. So I can demonstrate that here. If I go and create that function again foo that throws a value of 1 and over here, let's uh, call foo. And here we're going to catch the value of 1 or floating point value or this guy here. Okay, so let's run this. We can see exception 1 is caught. And now let's change this up to be goo. So void goo. What this guy's going to do is he's going to call foo and notice what happens here. I forgot to mention this earlier. Um, exceptions actually propagate all the way out until they find a catch statement to catch the throwing exception. So it doesn't actually have to be one step in. Notice here we're calling goo. Goo calls foo. Foo does the throwing. So the, th the throw from foo will come out to goo Goo doesn't handle it so it comes back out to this statement here where it tries to catch it and sure enough it does catch it so we catch that exception. If I run this, so run this, we see that we get an exception of 1. However, we could theoretically inside of goo handle the catch statement. So we can try to call foo and then here we're going to catch an integer. And notice what happens. The exception inside a goo gets called with a value of 1. 
we don't actually go down inside of this exception here because it didn't go that far. However, if we did throw something that wasn't an integer, like 1.5 for instance, then notice that the exception doesn't get caught inside of goo because goo only catches integers. So that exception that we threw of a floating point value tried to get caught here, it didn't, so continued propagating out where it was originally called, and down here this is where we catch it, so that's where we display the value. Now onto the topic of rethrowing. If we did want to catch it inside a goo, but also catch it outside of goo, to the function that called goo, then we can rethrow the uh, exception that we caught here. So here we saw that if we change this back to a 1, right now goo catches the exception and that's the only uh, place that it gets caught. But if we wanted to propagate that exception out further, then we could rethrow it. And the way we do that is just say throw with no parameter, like so. Now you can only do this if you are inside of a catch statement where you've already caught an exception. So now when I run this, notice what happens. The exception gets caught inside a goo, but then we rethrow the value of 1, so then it gets caught again over here where we tried to call goo, and that's where we get that second display to the screen for that exception being thrown. And again, as we mentioned before, uh, you don't have to throw the same value that you got. Here we are just calling throw, so that means rethrow the thing that we got, but we could theoretically throw something out completely different, like so. In that case, we're going to catch one, we're going to throw 4.44, and then we're going to catch 4.44 out here. So there's a lot of uh, sort of details that you can handle on how you want to be throwing exceptions, where you want to be catching them, how you want to be handling them. All of that I think I've now covered uh, in the examples that we've gone through. Just be aware that inside of a class constructor, Rethrowing is done for you automatically. Anywhere else, you, if you want the exception to get propagated out, you will have to rethrow it yourself. Um, I think that's it. Oh, um, you will also notice that there is syntax like this. So this looks like a statement for a function. So it's a function signature that says this swap function has a void value for return type. It has a parameter that you pass in. And typically you would see uh, something like const over here. Well, if you type throw bracket bracket, what you're telling the compiler is that this function is exception safe, meaning it will not throw an exception. That's what this syntax here means. This, this syntax basically says this function does not throw any exception. Just by looking at the header file of a class, if you do see something like this, that, that's what they're trying to tell you. That function is safe from exceptions, so if you call it, you shouldn't expect anything to be thrown back. So I just wanted to mention that in case you do come across that kind of thing when you're looking at other people's code. So if you have any questions about exceptions, uh, head on down to the forums, where after posting this VMK, uh, add in a new section into the C++ section on the VMK-related forums. Inside of here, under the general C++ VMK, you'll find VMK number, I think we're on number 25 now. So there'll be a VMK number 25 exceptions, and post your questions there, and hopefully me or some of the other members on the community will be able to answer your questions.